Hello, um, I'm Alex Wills. Um, I'm MD at RGA London. Um, RGA is a design and marketing company, but we've had a bit of a history, which I'm going to briefly go into, and then get into some case studies, and then talk a little bit about um, the AR cloud and, and something that Kevin Kelly talked about uh, very, very well yesterday, often called the mesh, called the VR cloud, called all sorts of things, but I'm going to talk about a few different things. So. Um, RGA was set up in 1977 by uh, Bob Greenberg. It's Robert Greenberg Associates. And it actually wasn't a marketing or design company. It was a visual effects uh, title company. And we did uh, a lot of effects uh, for title sequences like Superman, Alien, The Untouchables, many, many, many different sequences. Um, what it was all about, this looks very old school now, but it was all about marriaging creativity and technology together and pushing things forward, pushing the creativity forward using technology. Um, this is an Oxbury um, uh, uh, stand. We used this to create the optical sequence for Superman, which at the time had never been done before. It looks a little bit dated now, but this is sort of the inception of the company. Um, over the years, uh, Bob has disrupted the company many times. Um, you can see the different phases of our trajectory. Uh, we did commercial production for a while. And then in around 1995, when the internet was just sort of kicking in, Bob totally pivoted the company. Um, and he understood what the power of the web was going to bring. Uh, a lot of people thought he was slightly mad. A lot of people left. Uh, and, uh, and the formation of what RGA is now uh, sort of uh, kicked off then. And we did a lot of work for Nike. We did the chip in the shoe with Apple and Nike. Um, we did a lot of websites, a lot of interactive experiences like Nike ID. Um, and we continue to sort of develop the agency for the digital age uh, up to very recently and now uh, where we are at now, which is a real range. It's everything from consultancy uh, to a venture studio. Uh, so we've accelerated 150 companies. Um, and that keeps us kind of in the game. Personally, I've got a, a particular interest in immersive technologies. I think they're going to be game changing. Um, and hopefully, a little bit of what we see today will, will sort of uh, you know, get you excited about it too. But first, a little brief history, um, uh, very, very brief history. But it's quite good to go back, because this stuff's been around for a long time. Um, this is often called the Sword of Damocles. It looks a bit like early Magic Leap prototypes, but this was designed by a guy called Ivan Sutherland, very clever guy, um, in 1965. Um, and the amazing thing about this um, is that you know, the same principles and the same ideas are what was driving it today. The technology just wasn't, wasn't there yet. Um, he has a lovely quote, which he says, um, with appropriate programming, such a display could literally be the wonderland into which Alice walked. Um, pretty um, prophetic stuff. Um, this is him demoing it out. Not that mobile, not that uh, uh, user friendly, but you know, again, sort of hinted at what, what the possibilities were. And it's good to see that. What, what's interesting is the jump now to sort of this. I don't know if people remember um, the virtual reality company um, tried, tried their hand at it um, in, the, in the early 90s. Um, and they're pretty clunky. And the problem we just couldn't get is latency. The latency is what made everyone sick. Nothing could move quickly enough. Um, and it just wasn't a great experience. So again, sort of had its sort of peak of interest and then kind of fell away again. He had a couple of films of varying quality, like Lawn Merman. Um, Sega had a crack at uh, the VR headset, never came out. Um, Nintendo had a crack at one. Uh, the Virtual Boy, again, um, didn't kind of do very well. Uh, but they were sort of pushing the format. I could understand the benefits or the power of this format. This thing came out, and not that Apple kickstarted everything, but the smartphone really kickstarted the next generation of uh, tech. Uh, because of the displays, because of the rampant demand, that's why we sort of got to um, Oculus. You know, really, that's how the latency got sorted. Uh, the screens got small enough. The chips got more powerful. And that was really the breakthrough there. We then had Cardboard, which opened it up and democratized it. Uh, we had the Vive. We had PlayStation. Um, and now we've had AR kit. So not VR, but AR. And everyone now thinks that AR is the big thing. And it is a big thing. But I think VR and AR can coexist quite nicely. Um, AR kit. It doesn't do anything hugely different to what's gone before. It just nails the tracking brilliantly. Uh, same for AR Core on Google's platform. Um, and there are other sort of incumbents around there which are well worth checking out, like the Void, proper full immersive destinational VR, which is going to be pretty interesting. Um, and we all know this one, Magic Leap, which may or may not come out this year. Fingers crossed it does. Uh, but I think version 3 will probably be the one that's, that's the one that gets everyone excited. Version 1 um, is going to be cool, but I think uh, it's got a bit of a way to go. So anyway, a bit of a history. It's good to sort of see where we've been. And you know, AR is nothing new. Uh, it's been around for a while. Uh, it's just getting to the point where we can do some really interesting things around uh, uh, with it. Um, and we're getting excited about some of these things. Uh, we're trying to uh, develop. I'd say these are prototypes, even though some of these are campaigns. Some of these are launched for big clients. But I think it's all testing and learning at the moment. No one's got the answer. 
Um, I think something you'll see in this example for Nike is that it shouldn't just be the tech. It shouldn't be that, that thing. It has to have a user experience sort of end to end. Because if you just put your headset on or if you just put your glasses on uh, and do this experience, it's, it's, uh, it's just, it doesn't bring you into the, the mixed reality that well. You need a sort of lead up. So I think it's the end to end user experience which is really interesting. You can borrow a bit from immersive theater. So Jordan, uh, pretty iconic brand. Um, the All-Star uh, weekend was happening in Los Angeles at the beginning of the year, and um, Nike Jordan were, were sponsoring it. So the brief to us was like, well, what can you do? What iconic thing can we do around this moment to really sort of uh, reward fans and celebrate this moment? So we um, cleverly did this, uh, Air Jordan, AR Jordan, and we thought, well, let's do an AR experience, but how can we do something to that point I just made, a bit more end-to-end, -end, a bit more engaging, um, something that's sort of not just this, this moment, this gimmick. There's a lot of gimmicks out there with tech, a lot of gimmicks with, with AR at the moment. How can we make it a bit more than that? So this was the brief. We were going to celebrate this moment. We wanted to offer an exclusive product. They were bringing back the classic Jordans, Tinker's like, best shoes. Um, and so we wanted to do it by social, and we wanted to get these products out to people uh, really, really quickly and create something that hadn't been done before. So a nice, easy brief. Um, started off with the UX. You know, we really looked into the, sort of the, uh, the journey, how it was going to all fit together. Um, and we looked at AR, and we looked at Dancing Hot Dog, now really the Snapchat platform, um, because you know, consumer-friendly AR scale platform is, is really that at the moment. Um, and we played around with that. Uh, we needed a 3D model, because as everyone knows, for, for AR and VR, you need really, really good 3D assets. And when you're doing a 3D model of Michael Jordan, you need to make sure it's pretty good, because he's signing it off. Um, we also needed to do, uh, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to fulfill this. We wanted to do a mobile commerce solution. So we knew, because we work a bit with Shopify, that they were playing around with doing this on the platform with Snap. So we went, OK, let's try and do something with that. Um, and we want to do express delivery. So uh, we partnered with 2K Sports on the model. Um, we partnered with Shopify on the mobile commerce. And we partnered with one of our venture companies, Darkstore, who do, um, they make use of uh, spare fulfillment uh, uh, capacity um, in the States at the moment. And so we could use them to do really rapid, small uh, scale delivery and fulfillment. Um, this is the model that um, 2K created, super detailed model. Luckily, he signed it off with not too much trouble. Um, and this has sort of formed the basis of the, uh, of the, the uh, experience. And, and this is what it sort of looked like in the AR experience itself. Um, you know, pretty, pretty nice experience, really well tracked, uh, beautiful sort of 3D. Um, and then this was the uh, iconic shoe itself. And so how it worked, um, we geofenced uh, the court outside the Staples Center where the event was going on. Um, you got this snap code. Um, you hit the snap code, and you would be taken straight to uh, purchase immediately. Uh, choose your shoe size and um, uh, check it out. And this immediately then triggered to Dark Store, and these were um, fulfilled to you at home in two hours' uh, time. So really, really neat experience. Um, crowd went slightly mad for it. Um, uh, it's quite handy that he's up in the air, because one of the problems with AR is, is, is occlusion, or the lack of it. Um, so it's quite handy that, that no one was sort of crossing in front of him. Um, and a really, really cool experience. Got loads and loads of buzz. Um, really, really good um, stuff. Uh, and everyone was very happy. So it was a world first, um, but I think the interesting thing about it, um, you know, and it did really, really well, I think hopefully from that example, you see that this sort of end-to-end -end experience is the way to go. Not just we could have just done the AR thing, cool, but I think as you do that end-to-end -end experience, that's really fun. I think I might pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so Guinness, um, that's a terrible pint of Guinness. Um, Guinness are very, uh, uh, it's a very important to have a perfectly poured pint of Guinness, much more so than more beers because of the nitrogenation. Um, so we wanted to help make Barman and bar staff and bars all over the world make better pints of Guinness. They have a lot of quality ambassadors, but these quality ambassadors can't get around to all the places. So we used one of our startups, Clarify, to use computer vision um, to create a very simple web app. Uh, so not an app app, but web app up there. At least it uses visual recognition to help uh, check the perfect pint of Guinness. Um, it's quite handy. There's black and white. That helps the, the visual recognition system. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a neural network, and we fed it with tons and tons of good, bad, and ugly pints of Guinness. Um, and it can tell the head height. It can tell if you've done Irish tears, if you over pour it, um, the glassware, the correct branding, all these things. Um, it's a prototype. Um, we're rolling it out in America to test it to see if it'll work. Um, we're hoping to get to 95% accuracy. Um, it's really, really neat because you know we just can't scale uh, the bodies to get around these pubs. Digital can play a part, and visual recognition can play a really interesting part too. Um, 
But where's it kind of going? You know, I think this, the title of the talk is collapsing the digital and physical. I think with the visual recognition and the AR, you know, we're really getting to this really sort of neat point where it's getting pretty seamless. It's getting pretty uh, uh, close to sort of perfectly marrying the, uh, uh, the digital and the physical together. Um, this is a quote by a very smart chap called um, uh, Matt Misniex who runs 6D. Um, you know, my personal belief is that useful apps can be built on ARKit, but they can only be useful to some people occasionally. Uh, what we really need is the AR cloud, the mesh, the VR cloud, the V cloud, lots of different uh, titles for it. But what it's really saying, it's a digital twin of the entire world and everything in it, which is pretty ambitious. Um, it's interesting to see who's going to try and make it. Um, 6D are very well placed to, to create it. Um, and the key thing why we need it is for these four things. So at the moment, there's no persistency with AR. You can put something in AR here, and for a moment, it'll be there, and then it'll disappear. Now, you can see it. You can see it all at the same time. There's no persistent content, and it's not multiplayer. It seems really basic stuff, because we're very used to multiplayer games and, uh, and the very notion of the social web. web. AR can't do that, because it's really, really difficult, uh, technologically difficult to do. Occlusion's another one. Um, as I said, with the AR Jordan experience, um, the problem is if you have something AR there and then everyone walks through it, it kind of kills the experience pretty quickly. We're not good enough yet. Well, kit isn't good enough to occlude the object behind a 3D. You need scanning. Um, it's pretty heavy duty. So that's another one. But startups are looking at that space. And we need to create this 3D model of the world. You know, there's lots of 3D assets in the world. There's lots of digital twins. But they're not in place, in situ, geolocated. Um, so that's all got to happen. And some people are doing some really interesting stuff. So Blue Vision are a UK startup, um, just got a tranche of funding. And they're doing some interesting stuff. They, they're cracking some of the tough parts of it, which is the social aspect. So two users can see the same thing here. Um, the tracking's not on, on but it's, it's doing some really, really clever stuff. And it's doing it by using just a phone camera to start building out this AR cloud, this, this digital twin. As you can see here, you can quickly sort of replicate this pretty intricate uh, you know, replica of the real world. Um, another crew called Scape, um, uh, I spoke to their founder the other day. They're going to come out with some pretty interesting things in a couple of months' time. Again, they're using your camera and some very clever back-end um, smarts to get world-scale AR. AR at the moment is very, very local. It's kind of on a tabletop. It's really cool. But to get really, really cool, you want to you get out in the world. And that's quite hard because a camera uh, can't really scan uh, you know, to do AR kit. It can only do that far. This is now taking that on and doing the world-scale AR, which is AR, which is really, really neat. And uh, this is uh, Matt's company, 6D. Um, again, not, not, doesn't look that pretty, but um, it's doing some pretty heavy duty stuff. Just using, again, the camera phone, able to create very, very um, uh, you know, accurate models of uh, the real world in real time. And these companies are building up this, this cloud, which will ultimately power all of these AR kit and AR core and AR apps that we see today and really push it on as the next platform to coin what, um, what Kevin was saying yesterday. Um, and this is an interesting company as well. Improbable.io, they recently, well, a couple of years ago now, maybe got, got a lot of funding from SoftBank. Um, they do a very interesting server OS that helps um, do massive simulations. They do a lot in games. These, this company could be very well placed to do some interesting things here. Um, and Tim's saying a lot of interesting things around AR. It's not too difficult to decode how important Apple um, it feels around this subject and, and, and what they're doing around it. Quite overtly, uh, quite um, under the covers at the moment, um, but I think we're going to see some really interesting things and get to glassware probably in three to five years' time. So just end on a few takeouts. Um, I think it's really important to develop foundational strategies now. There's going to be loads of gimmicks. There's going to be loads of, um, you know, good and bad stuff. That's fine um, and important. But if, if you need to do it to speed, you need to have the strategy in place to go long term, look to three years, um, but do these tests and learns on top of it. If you do one or the other, it's not really going to get traction. Um, test and learn off the basis of that framework, for sure. Um, you know, Combine multiple platforms and SDKs. This is pretty obvious stuff, but it's amazing having sat in a meeting with Apple where they're literally sort of saying AR can only do this, this, and this, because that's what AR kit can do. There's lots of other startups that can do loads of other things. Combining those can really push the boundaries and do some interesting stuff. Um, the startup space is super interesting. Um, we were judging some today, some really interesting ideas going there. Um, and build a really diverse team. You know, It's not just tech, authors, immersive theater, um, they're the people who sort of understand some of this stuff already, um, and that's what you want in a really, really mixed disciplinary team. I think it's really important. Um, and then experiment, have fun, do really different things, um, and really sort of push the boundaries. Um, 
And lastly, experience it. So this is uh, our office in, in London. If anyone's around, come in. Um, you've got to try it. You know, still, it amazes me how little people are trying a proper uh, positional VR or really immersive um, experiences. A lot of people are still sort of dismissing it amazingly. Try, try as much as you can. Try the void. Uh, try positional VR. Try as much AR as you can, because it really is, 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 pretty, is pretty exciting. Um, and that's all for me. Thank you very much.